Cambridge University, and I'm uh, head of department of physiology that relates to bone and bone formation. Food intake is, of course, very important in stress situations. Uh, drug development, that's a little bit off, uh, off the record here. Fish aquaculture and welfare. And if we look at the first term, stress physiology and welfare, the rest is sort of sandwiched because good welfare, well-being of your fish, is dependent on understanding how stress physiology operates. I mean, I've been in Japan uh, several times. Um, so let's see what we can learn from these fish. For those, <coughs> those who are interested and want to contact me uh, at the university, the fish is slightly anesthetized with uh, metamosulfonate in the water. This is the rearing condition, 25 degrees Celsius. The water is, the fish is intubated and kept under anesthesia with the MS2 to low radio levels. And the fish is in a bore of a magnet. And there is an antenna here. And we can flush the gills with the water of choice. And then we can switch the, the, the tap. So all of a sudden the water goes from 25 to 15. The fish remains under, under, under anesthesia. And now we can do fMRI. And what is fMRI? So, uh, in a minute, how, how it looks. Here is first the experiment. The boxes are the cortisol levels, here the, so the stress levels of the fish, and the red boxes is just the handling. Because the fish is an ectotherm, so it means water temperature determines its biochemistry. And the brain is the control center and needs to be protected. And what the fish is doing is insulating the brain with warm blood. The blood is still warm. And the fish brings blood around the brain to keep it at temperature and keep it functioning for a while. So it's a really interesting thing. And <clears throat> the other thing we were interested in is to see whether in this pituitary gland here, this is the cavity again, whether there is an increase of blood flow. Because our prediction is that there is a stress access activity. So that means that they should go blood to the ACTA cells in the, in the pituitary gland to bring the ACTH to the adrenals. And yes, we can see that even within the pituitary there is a subdivision, only the part where the ACTA cells are receives more blood. And that's of course exactly what you want if you want to launch a stress response. Now here we see what happens in bold fMRI. So here the blue means that cells are going to take up more oxygen. What happens is that if the cells use oxygen, oxygen is taken from the hemoglobin, and hemoglobin with and without uh, oxygen is paramagnetic and diamagnetic. So you have two, you have sort of a contrast dye based on hemoglobin, <coughs> and the contrast comes from whether there is oxygen or not bound to the hemoglobin. We focus now on the pituitary gland. Here is a, a, a full a shot, a full hit of the pituitary fish and say, well, there is no nerves here or anything, maybe there's not even a brain, so we can hook the fish and, well, what's going on? The other question, uh, and the important thing, of course, is what is blue over there is this dotted area in your brain. So, for sports fishermen and fisheries in general, it's very handy to say there is no part of the brain that can deal with this pain. You say that there are no sensors for pain in the head of the fish, and this holds for all fish, I can tell you. This is from the work uh, on trout by Lynn Snedden, and she has characterized at least three types of uh, receptors. So at the molecular level, receptors in the head region, these are receptors that uh, propagate painful stimuli uh, signaling in the feeding system. So if you activate your stress axis, you will activate CRF release to the brainstem, and that is easy to understand. Because this is an anorexic genic signal. It stops you from eating. That's what anorexia means, no eating. If you activate CRF systems and you activate CRF here, it will send a signal to the brain that stop eating. So now you see how, how simply, in fact, these systems are linked to one another. It was scarcity. So if you overfeed it, it will take the energy and store it somewhere. Uh, finally, this is almost the end. I want to show you 
some results that have not been published, so please keep it for yourself. This is important enough to show. The red line, if you allow the fish to feed themselves, because the situation that you create here is in fact an ideal ad libitum situation. As long as the fish are willing to hit that ball, they will get food. What we see, if you give not too much food, so in this case it's maybe 20 fish in an aquarium, 40 grams each, and they get one gram per hit, then these fish will eat all the food. But what is more important for, for this picture is that they eat before the lights go on, they eat somewhere during the day, and they eat when the lights are off for a few hours. This is at one gram per hit. If we do two grams per hit, these peaks go up and they don't eat at all during the day. If we now do the experiment that we calculate or we register how much food they feed themselves, if we give the same amount of food and fat during the day to a group parallel to this, these fish grow one and a half times faster than the fish that we feed by net. How can it be? Well, I think this is the innate uh, clock of the fish, so the carp, and I think the Chinese already knew, carp is a night fish, people go fishing at night for carp. They prefer to eat at night, and if you allow them to eat at night, then apparently the physiology of the intestine is optimal to make the food conversion about 50% better than under hand fat conditions as we impose them to fish normally. Here you see the numbers for that. Perfect controls, this is one, just one experiment. Uh, they start at more or less the same uh, conditions, and then you see uh, the increase in the specific growth rate and food conversion in Taiwan. And uh, thank you for your attention. I hope it was not too difficult. Thank you.